Hello, everyone. I would like to say uh, an early good evening to those of you in London. Um, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Um, good morning, if you might be joining from the West Coast. I, I see the participants are, are filling the room, so we'll just give everyone uh, another little moment there. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Zoe Whitley, Director of Chisholm Hale Gallery in London, and I'm delighted to welcome artist Shazad Dawood to the program today. Um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. I know many of us have done many of these Zoom events over the years, so we're going to take it a little bit like flying on a plane and we're gonna do the safety announcement one more time. Um, so please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We'll be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Shazad and they'll be answered at the end of the program. I will be monitoring the Q&A box. So um, we're very happy to, to have your input at any time throughout this process. Um, if you would like closed captioning, and if that's helpful to you for your access needs, a live transcript is available by clicking the icon on your navigation bar. Um, and now, on behalf of our hosts, Yale University, we acknowledge that Indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pagosset, Nihantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and their land. It's now my very great pleasure to spend the rest of the hour in conversation with an artist that I'm lucky to call a friend. Also, he's our Chisholm Hill neighbor. And beyond that, as a Chisholm Hill trustee, technically my boss, <laughs> um, artist Shazad Dawood. So um, we will be delving in to a range of the artist practices um, using slides. Um, but before that, just to give uh, the tiniest overview of a really extraordinary biography. Um, Shazad was born in London and is a multidisciplinary artist who interweaves stories, realities, and symbolism to create richly layered artworks spanning digital media, film, painting, sculpture, and textiles. Um, we're gonna have a great time this hour because there's really so much to see and discuss. Um, Shazad is fascinated by ecologies and architecture and takes a philosophical approach in his work, asking questions and exploring alternative futures through what he calls world building and imagineering. Um, and the fact that he's always doing this with other people in such a big hearted collaborative way is something that I've been lucky to witness myself, but certainly something we'll delve into more deeply shortly. His practice is animated by research, and by collaboration with multiple audiences and communities to delve into embodiment, history, and narrative. So I think that's a great place for Shazad to start our slides and for us to really begin a narrative centered on you. Welcome, Shazad. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's really nice to be here and welcome to everyone else. Um, I hope you enjoy where we might roam in the next hour. Oh, I think we're going to have a great time. Um, and I love that you've started by taking us to Al Ula, um, the desert in Saudi Arabia, where we both found ourselves last February um, for the opening of Desert X. And I, so let's begin with Coral Acclamy 1 and 2. Um, many people think about time in their work, but that is sometimes in years, um, perhaps decades, maybe centuries, but in your case, you do it in terms of millennia. Um, and so much of your work is about deep time. Um, and here we are 
in the Saudi Arabian desert in this image. Um, we see your sculpture in the foreground, but can you tell us a bit about this site and how it specifically relates to um, your engagement with deep time? Yeah, well, Zoe, the, the site in Alula, the, the particular canyon that was used for the last edition of Desert X would have been what uh, the delta of what is now the Red Sea about 11 million years ago. And for me, that was a source of fascination. I mean, you know, I think sometimes when we think through ecology, it's often in a much shorter time frame, so post-industrial revolution to the present. And, you know, I'm fascinated with, you know, deserts having once been oceans and vice versa, and where, you know, we as humans actually inhabit the barest moment in the lifespan of the planet. And, you know, I remember doing a, an initial site visit in the desert and people thinking I was somewhat unhinged because I was scrabbling up cliffs looking for fossil, you know, traces. And, and obviously I found them. And, you know, for this particular project, I was working with a number of marine biologists based at KAUST and NEOM universities, as well as geologists to kind of verify, you know, my assumptions and to sort of try and dig a bit deeper. And we looked at two species of corals, you know, from the nearby Red Sea, and and that were under you know stress impact but also thinking i was very interested in a bringing these back out into the desert but also bringing them above ground because i think you know we're often able to ignore the oceans because we don't see beneath the surface you know in our quotidian gaze and i wanted to, to sort of create a a more visceral and even tactile relationship to coral, you know, coral reef ecosystems. Well, I think you did that in so many ways. And one of those ways was in the way that the, the pigment itself responded to the sun. Um, so those of us who saw the work um, could see it effectively mimicking um, the organic material, but equally there were times when it was pitch black. So could you talk to us about how, um, the very material that you used changed the viewer's experience. Particularly with sculpture, I'm interested in it in its morphology, you know, how it can be, because sculpture, I suppose, is classically something that's quite heavy and weighted. And I'm interested in it. Having, fixed, yeah. Fixed. Whereas I'm interested in, in, it, in playing with that, you know, just playing with the fact that it can be kinetic, it can be changing. Um, and particularly with these works, I was interested in, in the cycles of night and day and how they might extrapolate to kind of, you know, a wider impact over time. So I'm often kind of experimenting with specialist paint finishes for my sculptural works. In, in this case, we were using something called thermochromic paint, um, which, which changes according to the ambient temperature. So basically the, the sculptures would overnight turn to a sort of carbon black, but then during the day they would pass through their natural underwater fluorescence, but at the high point of temperature in the desert, they would completely bleach. So you had this very visceral experience of Anthropocene impacts on reef systems. It really is extraordinary. And if we go to um, Coral Alchemy 2, which you also have a slide of, I, I think it really beautifully illustrates that point you were making about um, not only scrambling up the, the cliffs, but equally what it means for us to understand ourselves as um, these kind of minute blips in the larger scheme of time, because um, the vantage point of Coral Alchemy 1 um, is where one would be standing, and then we would be looking up at this one. Um, so I guess in terms of the, your thinking and the site placement of the work, um, how important was that to kind of engage in that sense of scale and the, in the awesomeness of the, the canyon's vastness? <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the kind of key difficulties with such a challenging site was, you know, what do you do that can actually speak to something that is so much larger than what any one artist can kind of muster? And so I was interested in thinking about 
how to situate. For me, it was very clear that I wanted two works, one sited in the in the sort of valley floor and one up on the on an escarpment of the canyon. So it created relationship, you know, site scale, but also so you'd have the first work, Coral Alchemy One, where you were in direct, you know, physical contact with it. And then the other one that kind of drew your gaze upwards to the to the you know to the cliff faces, which I mean, if you look at the sort of pock marks and indentations on the cliff faces, those were all sculpted by water. They're the trace mm. of ancient oceans, um, you know, and the site actually dates back 400 million years in total. So, you know, if you think about the action of water over that desert over literally hundreds of millions of years, you know, I wanted to kind of signpost to the larger kind of environment. And what it absolutely did, there's something so awe-inspiring about not only you stating that fact or um, the kind of the explainers who are so kind of supercharged, excited and enthusiastic about your work and about documenting the way that it changed, but it, it creates a rootedness to place that I think is otherwise kind of very difficult to imagine. So you're able to then bring us on this journey where we are able to conceive something that while your shoes are full of sand, otherwise seems completely inconceivable. Um, and I think that, that that might actually be a useful point for us to, to go to the next slide, which... Um, which is another view and shall I, I'll keep going. Yeah, that's great. So then if we are, we're here with the Leviathan project and this is um, a, a many chaptered project of yours that um, I think equally um, for me formally looking at these kind of incredible tones with the, the polychromatic paint um, that speaks to your sensitivity to the, the materials that you select and again, looking just beyond uh, the canal, um, that there's always this interplay between where the work is cited and how we'll be able to experience it. But perhaps you might want to say something about um, this very different body of work and a, and a choice of very different materials to convey the, the context. Yeah, well, in a way, there's always this sort of idea, I guess, within my practice that that elements exist, you know, within particular series or bodies, but I do believe that they, they all map out and connect. So in a way, you know, this work called Where Do We Go Now was actually um, kind of revisiting um, a, a pamphlet uh, publication by Jonathan Swift called A Tale of a Tub, which was his own response to Hobbes's Leviathan. And it's really thinking about the impact of capital on social well-being. And so the original, the allegory in the original piece of writing is, is about a, a group of um, sailors who are being th threatened by the beast Leviathan, which is the whale of state. And they throw out barrels, hence tubs in it, you know, 18th century parlance, to distract the whale. And obviously the, the barrels um, symbolize their, their capital or labor. So their labor is their way of distracting the beast of state from smashing the boat in. And I, I, I sort of uh, based the sculpture on the original frontispiece engravings, but mm. it adapted it to kind of mix uh, 18th century sailors with uh, refugees. And the polychromatic uh, uh, paint finish is, is another one I'd sort of been developing for a number of years. And I really like it as this sort of oil on water, you know, mm. which is sometimes this idea of of coming together, but but two things not meeting. And you know, you can see the sort of um, metaphorical potential of that. And then also talking, going back to this idea of kinetics, as you move around it, it changes, and it changes according to the time of day and the light. Mm. And so the sculpture is appears to move like like the water surrounding the boat and you know i love that idea of something that's that's undulating you know that it's it's not static 
And, and I think that this is important for everyone to recognize because that's equally true for your source material. So, you know, you're starting with Jonathan Swift, but as someone who researches so deeply, you're also thinking about um, the notions of, of, of so many of the other people that you read. Maybe if we go to the next image, it will be a, a useful place for us to have this conversation. So um, here we have another resonant polychromatic paint sculpture, um, but this one really kind of delving into your interest in the post-human. And so I initially immediately went to Donna Haraway and then you pulled me in some fabulous other directions. So um, a geneticist that you mentioned was um, Prof Professor Escovilislev, is that That's correct? right, Professor Escovilislev, who I, you know, one of the kind of craziest things that's happened to me in the, you know, over the course of my practice and research is, you know, I guess some, some years ago, you know, in about 2015, I started going out and speaking to scientists and academics and oceanographers. And, you know, I was actually asked to interview Professor Escovilislev uh, for CPH Docs, the film festival in Copenhagen. And, you know, he's probably one of the world's leading evolutionary geneticists. And one of the, you know, having read and immersed myself in Donna Haraway, uh, but also equally in Terence McKenna, who is a you know a key source for this work one and is of, the the titular essayist so they wrote an essay called on becoming virtual octopi is that right he did where he talked about you know humans hitting the threshold of of simian evolution and that the next phase would be cephalopod so octopus and squid based evolution and thinking about their cognitive perceptual fields you know they see the world prismatically and of course, they have color change abilities, a lot of octopus mm. and squid. And, you know, so obviously I got around to asking Professor Vilislev in front of an audience, you know, would we ever get to a point where we could, you know, splice our DNA with an octopus and, you know, in the way their programming designer babies think about uh, whether we could take on any of the sort of um, genetic survival characteristics of other species, particularly, obviously, but, you know, I asked him about, would I ever be able to kind of, you know, or my descendants be able to take on the sort of color change ability of an octopus? Yeah. You know, I think I'm fascinated for that, for how we might speak about race and gender in future generations as well, yeah. and think through it, you know, also coming out what of- What was once fixed that becomes something that's mutable and changeable. Exactly. And again, this idea of a sort of morphology that, you know, what we might consider the human is perpetually in a state of flux, as much as we like to cling on to stable ground, we're essentially unstable beings. Well, even even the notion of science, like what what shifts between being a scientific fact to being a scientific fiction um, and and the vacillations between the two, I think constantly do this kind of wonderful choreography in your work. Um, maybe we should go to the to the next image. Um, so one of the things that I think is remarkable is that you could speak to um, four different people about your work and they might describe you in four different ways, you know, as a sculptor, as an artist filmmaker, as a, an artist who works with textiles um, and many other ways besides. So I think here there's something interesting in looking at uh, the fact that while this body of work is from 2017, um, you've been working in various ways with indigenous craft knowledges um, and again in site-specific ways. So here we're back in Venice um, and you're using Fortini textiles, but you're using them in um, I felt like quite a, a Trojan horse way. So they're incredibly beguiling. They seem to relate to Venice, but then you're also using them to tell this much bigger story about um, migration, about what's lost. So perhaps you could tell us some more about the Labenhof cycle um, and these works in particular. Yeah, with pleasure. So the Labanoff cycle came out of a, a process of research with the Labanoff, which is the Laboratory of Anthropological Forensics at the University of Milan. And, you know, it's run by an amazing powerhouse of a woman called Christina Cataneo, and she and her team go out with UN rescue teams when boats sink or capsize, attempting the Lampedusa crossing from North Africa, and they document and archive 
um, personal possessions and artifacts lost at sea in order both to trace you know um, missing persons but also to bring cases to the European and other parliaments in cases of negligence or or even downright avoidance of um, migrant and refugee ships in trouble. And it's interesting, you know, when I was first speaking to Christina in 2016, we were already bemoaning the fact of, you know, Coast Guards turning a blind eye to migrant ships in distress. And, you know, if we think about how, I guess, you know, the the ethics of how we treat our, you know, our fellows has has actually seen a, a steep decline even since that moment. You know, it's it's funny how this works becomes ever more topical. I mean, I find it very important to keep presenting these works because this issue is only worsening in terms of how politicians, governments are dealing with it, talking about it. You know, the rhetoric around it is really, really ethically and fundamentally violent, violent and depressing. And yeah. it's and I don't know how we how any of those people responsible for that kind of rhetoric hope to ever come, you know, find a way out of the of the predicament we find ourselves in, because it's really one of our common humanity. Absolutely. I mean, it's front page news in London today, so um, couldn't possibly be more topical. If we move to the next slide, I think there's something um, worth alighting on here, precisely to your point about the representation of works. So we're not showing this slide to just show these works from, from another angle, but there's a much bigger intent that you have in terms of the circulation of relics and to that point of how they can exist as both uh, material memory, um, but also, as you were saying, sometimes very literally as, as legal evidence. So um, might you say something about how these works exist in, in different ways or how the, the understanding of the works evolve as they move from one context to the next. So they would moved from, um, from Venice here to, to Wales. I think, you know, the, the conversation, um, which I, I guess I, for a long time, I felt, you know, it's, it's a bit of political sleight of hand because we know there's an even bigger refugee crisis down the road due to climate. And I think a lot of the sort of negative rhetoric is anticipating that even if it's not speaking to it. And I think there's, you know, an importance in representing these works because the issue has not gone away. It's only grown, you know, more extreme. Um, you know, so for example, actually, I'm, we're looking to be presenting a whole body of these works at Salisbury Cathedral um, this winter, which feels mm -hmm. like a very appropriate setting, um, because for those who don't know, Salisbury Cathedral holds one of the original copies of the Magna Carta. And if we think about this idea about, you know, the relationship between, in, in the case of the Magna Carta, the king, the nobles, and the state, you know, it's one... You know, I think that negotiation of power responsibility is as well in constant need of renegotiation. So mm -hmm. I think um, presenting these works in different contexts to different audiences, also in different geog geographical locations, but because it is a world problem, it's not an it's not an isolated. You know, uh, it's not an isolated national concern. It's, and I think that's precisely it. There is this sense that, you know, the slippage that exists where if anyone wants to, to root something somewhere, oh, that's a problem that's only facing those people. I don't have to deal with that. And then the way that that then trickles into something else and the way, the way that we've seen, for instance, with uh, Ukraine or, you know, many other places besides. And I think that, that there's something about not only how the works are displayed and how you move through them and change your relationship to them that precisely always brings back that kind of um, incredibly haunting and lingering question about, you know, this could be one of us, you know, those of us looking at it, that, that could be your wallet, you know, that could, that could be, you know, the trace of a textile that you were bringing with you or that had been wrapped around you. And that, that sense of not only 
the scaling it of larger than life, but then of, of isolating um, a symbol in a manner that allows us to have a real moment of connection with it is something that um, I certainly feel recurs in the work. And um, I kept coming back to this notion of like the metonym, like the symbol of the, the part for the whole. And you do something very clever throughout your practice where there's this constant volleying between um, these kind of the meta issues, you know, going from the meta to the micro and back again. Um, that is what I help think connects those of us who maybe aren't so familiar with um, epigenetics or deep time to something that suddenly makes it um, relatable on a human scale again. Exactly. I think, you know, it is that constant relationship or dialogue between the part and the whole that becomes very important and allows, you know, with these works, but I think with others, people to move between the different elements and and home in on particular sigils or symbols that point outwards and back to kind of maybe the the meta narrative but allows you also to sort of focus in and have a very direct experience with a singular work um, why don't we move to the the next slide so here we are in the guggenheim in new york um if it's particularly extraordinary architecture. Um, and we're looking at an installation view of towards the possible film. Um, and this is interesting because while we've been speaking about the works somewhat in isolation up to this point, um, this film connects to the alternate geographies and landscapes um, in what becomes uh, the Leviathan series of films. Um, and many of your works um, kind of call and respond to one another or exist as kind of links in a chain to your wider oeuvre. So um, might you say something about towards the possible film as this kind of, of course it's a work in its own right, but then this kind of provisional work that then evolves into yet another work. I mean, it was interesting because I think, you know, obviously at the time you make something, you can't, you know, predict where the work will, will evolve to subsequently. But, you know, looking back, this work was very much, you know, without my consciously knowing it, a prequel to the Leviathan series of films. And although this does something very particular also that connects to the works in Alula, because it is about deep time, it's all shot, you know, in southern Morocco near the border with the Western Sahara, which is a very, you know, contested space but also has this very amazing um, geology around the coast. And also that geology connects to sort of pre-Islamic Morocco and Berber culture, which was all about, you know, animist grottos. So I was thinking about a sort of convergence of sort of myth and mythic archetypes. I had these, you know, blue skinned astronauts emerge not from the sky, but from the sea because, you know, this idea of the sea as a sort of uncharted zone is very important to me. And they encounter, you know, the quote unquote indigenous people. And there was a thinking through the writings of Pierre Clastre on, on you know, what is ind indigeneity and how do we, how do we read that? Um, and, you know, there's this, there's this sort of clash, uh, literally a clash of civilizations, but is it a clash of understanding? Is it that the indigenous people reject the new arrivals because they've already experienced the colonizer and, you know, and are not going to fall into the same trap again? There is a whole load of nuances about empathy um, and obviously this relationship to the sea, but also to sort of language. So, you know, I worked, I was, you know, very kindly invited by Omar Barada when he was running a uh, a translation uh, center at uh, Dar al Mamun outside of Marrakesh. And we invited a number of people to actually workshop the skeleton of the script. So, this idea of a sort of collaborative filmmaking process really, you know, really sort of caught on for me at this time and at this moment, which then expanded through the Leviathan body of work that would come, you know, come afterwards. So I should say this says 2021, that's when it was shown at the Guggenheim, but the work was actually made in 2014 and first shown then. Mm. So if we if we move on to an image still from 
um, one of the episodes of the Leviathan Cycle. Um, we find ourselves here um, in a mangrove. Um, and I think that it's an extraordinary image, but I'd love to know more about um, how this particular episode came to be, um, exactly where you shot it. Um, and again, how this starts to be part of um, one example of your much larger and deeper practice in relating to um, not only marine ecology, but then relating that back to um, the lives of individuals and the kind of increasing precarity of our, of our circumstances. And I mean that for, for all of us. Yeah. Well, the Leviathan cycle, just to give some context for people who haven't come to it previously, imagines the world 20 to, roughly 20 to 50 years from now and what that might look like. And it evolves from maybe it's it was always intended as a 10 episode sort of season or series of films, but you know, not in your typical HBO or Netflix kind of linearity. But it, it sort of roams across different situations, locations. And if episode one to five, we're looking at a sort of breakdown, which I feel we're now inhabiting. Um, mm. Episode six through 10 look at methods for surviving the future. And in episode seven, we find ourselves in Senegal. And, you know, apart from corals, coral reefs, another great passion of mine is mangrove ecosystems. So in this image, we are literally journeying into the mangroves and it becomes almost like a spiritual journey and a quest for a sort of recapturing meaning um mm. you know mangroves are a fascinating ecosystem in terms of water filtration in terms of carbon capture in terms of um our potential to use nature-based systems to alleviate sea level rise uh and and you know um, land erosion. So that's already the setting, you know, has all of those things sort of vibrating or resonating. But equally, this became an interesting departure into co authoring in the within the cycle. So for seven, I worked with uh, Ken Bagul, who's a, a, a poet, um, a shaman in Senegal, Africana was the sort of nom de plume taken by a, a very eminent social scientist uh, and and um, human rights lawyer in Senegal. And I asked them to imagine themselves in 50 years time if Senegal has become a model utopia. And, you know, we workshopped it together and I came up with a set of questions to be asked by one of the recurring characters through the cycle to these two amazing women as a kind of collaborative imagineering and how did you how did you come to that to apply that word to your own work because you know prior to getting to know you i certainly i'll be honest i only knew it in like a you know a walt disney kind of context um, but i do think it's a really helpful way of um, trying to understand your particular fusion of um, research-based scientific practices, um, a, a mind that's kind of geared toward uh, engineering and uh, material knowledge, and equally this kind of the vastness of the imagination and the harnessing of kind of collective imaginations. But um, I didn't know if there was perhaps another starting point or reference for you. No, I think in a way, you know, I was, I spent a lot of time thinking about certain tropes um, that were used by, say, you know, Disney or other big corporations, particularly in the media sphere, and was interested in perhaps repurposing or recapturing that that term for a way in which, as you say, I'm I'm always very interested to find my own way through a kind of a valley between. Um, you know, scientific research and a sort of poetics, because I feel the answer perhaps lies somewhere between those two things or those two poles, that perhaps science on its own with within the sort of peer reviewed journals of academia isn't doesn't really communicate some of the amazing knowledge that's being generated. And mm -hmm. perhaps, 
you know, I started to think, what is my role as an artist in that? And perhaps it's it's being able to kind of gain an understanding of the of those disciplines and very particular particular niche research, but think about the poetics and of course the aesthetics where those two things can do a dance and actually yield an experience to the viewer that that allows them to kind of see the world differently. I think, you know, artists in general, it's always about trying to open a door, isn't it? You're trying to open a door and take your audience on a walk mm. or a journey. Yeah, yeah helping us to, to see what you see. Um, I think if we go to the next image, uh, we end up with a really phenomenal example of prismatic vision at play, um, not only in this kind of the perceptual shifts that come from the layering of, of multiple images, but um, that relate back to some of your readings and references, for instance, the, the Terence McKenna on becoming virtual octopi. Um, but here you're starting to, um, in episode eight, further expand your, your process and film production. Um, and you were working with um, the, the members of the Guarani in the Brazilian rainforest. Um, so perhaps we could have some, some more context into Chris, Sandra, Papa and Yasmin and, uh, and episode eight. Yeah, well, you know, Yasmin was one of my recurring characters who we first encounter in, in episode two. And, you know, one of the things as I get to the end of this cycle of work is thinking about what are their, we've had these recurring characters in points, what are their out points? And, you know, it is a 10 episode body of work if I complete it. Um, and we will complete it. Inshallah. And no, if, exactly. No, I believe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Chris, Sandra and Papa became, uh, as well as a, a, a wonderful uh, Brazilian artist called Anita Ekman, became my, my very close collaborators on this episode. And I took it a step further than with episode seven because we actually co-authored and co-directed this work. And so it was thinking about, uh, you know, an, an ethics of practice and how to expand that idea of co-authorship, <coughs> pardon me, uh, but also thinking about how, how you get to the sort of prismatic vision, you know, that Terence McKenna espoused. So I'm always actually trying to keep a through line even within superficially different aspects of my practice, you might say that's a sculpture, this is a film, but some of the thoughts and research and a kind of approach are actually a, you know, a continuum. It's like a constellation. And so actually co-directing for me was a way of perhaps arriving at a, at a prismatic vision. And, and then obviously a, a very particular editing process I do has always got ideas of the multidimensional, this sort of layering of imagery, you know, because, you know, I'm not just trying to reproduce what, what exists in the world. I'm trying to create a visionary experience. I'm trying to take people on an immersive journey into, into states of mind and states of being. Mm. So shall we, if we move on to the next slide, um, this is, the perfect example to kind of lead from where we were to here, because um, as an artist, you, you've never shied away from the embrace of, of new and different technologies. And I think that one thing that's always important for us to bear in mind is that there are many different types of, of technology. So, you know, at a certain point, suspending uh, pigment in egg albumin for a fresco was a technology. And then oil paint becomes a technology. Magna paint, acrylic paint becomes uh, a technology. Um, but often if artists alight on a particular medium that that works for them, then there's less of a less of a hunger or drive to explore what might be possible in another medium. And yet, um, we see here um, with this VR headset um, that you are embracing yet another way to um, contain and deliver a message that is quite consistent across um, the larger body of work. So um, with this, the terrarium, are you able to tell us more about A, how you, how you came to VR 
um, as yet another means of elaborating your practice, but then beyond that, um, what this particular work entails, because it starts to um, really allow for we as, as viewers or as exhibition goers to um, embody some of that post-humanity that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd always been interested in an idea of immersion, you know, even through sort of artistic film or thinking through exhibition making, you know, the, the use of different media was always about, in a way, creating a sort of, you know, an immersive theatre um, of experience. And, you know, I think I was initially, a, actually, if I'm honest, somewhat quite resistant to VR, mainly because I'd been interested in it in the 90s, but when it hadn't really delivered, it didn't live up to expectations. And, you know, I was, you know, encouraged into it um, by, by various people I was in dialogue with. And, you know, one of them actually met, got uh, the technology company HTC to give me one of their headsets in 2013 to experiment with. And I think that was what really gave me the opportunity to explore the medium. You know, those headsets didn't really become available even on the prosumer market till 2016. You know, mm -hmm. when I think a lot of artists were unfairly expected to sort of jump in within a couple of months, whereas, you know, I'd had a three years to really, I really like to break a technology. You know, I think it's really important. I think as an artist, you need to break something to, to build it, to make, you know, to build it back up, to really know what makes it tick and what, and what makes, you know, you're finding out what makes you tick in relationship to what makes a particular medium tick. And I really needed to do a deep dive and think about some of the ideas that are very salient for me, like embodiment, um, what that sort of experiential and even a sort of a narrativization could look like in a sort of non in a non-traditional way and so for example in this piece the terrarium it it does become a sort of extension of some of the thinking and work around uh leviathan but you know esker villaslev's research is in this because actually uh the woman in the headset is actually embodying the the post-human um hybrid being of on becoming virtual octopi so i adapted that sculpture as a as a being so it you know she is actually seeing herself with those armatures with those Ooh, tentacles kind of, yeah you know and i think the tentacular is also another way i guess i would think of my own practice in the way it sort of moves between media and tries to create you know constellations of meaning which i mm. also is very important to me because it makes it less hierarchical you know by creating constellations of meaning you're not telling people what to think you're inviting them into a space and to make their own links and their own meanings. Um, it's also never just about thinking or just about seeing. It's also about, you know, feeling, touching. There is this, this way of thinking about what it means to embody the totality of one's feelings or the senses at one's disposal, or certainly the, the greater in other senses that um, other forms of being have. At their disposal. That's a very good point, isn't it? Because for me, if it was just research, it would then fall back into didactic. So the research has to move into a kind of haptic, visceral, sensorial experience. And, you know, this, this takes you into 300 years into the future of the Baltic Sea. And, you know, Eska Vilaslev's ideas are in there. Uh, Professor Martin Ziegler, whose work on paleoclimatology helped me think through, you know, deep time and where you know, in 300 years, the likelihood is that Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands will be underwater and the Baltic will be one stretch from an eroded Kent coastline to the peninsula of Tallinn. And, you know, this was before the kind of recent geopolitical shocks that have that will probably further alter our understanding of those territorial borders. Yeah, that will continue to reverberate. I'm just aware of time. We've got we're, we're already down to our last 10 minutes. 
but we have one question in the Q&A, so I think we probably have time for another slide or two before we come to that question, and then, or if anyone else is emboldened to ask their question now, um, but I did definitely want us to get to this point, because we also then, rather than just describing, able to give people a flavor um, of one of your works, and this is Concert from Bangladesh, and uh, I, I feel very privileged that Chisholm Hill Gallery was able to present present this um, to East End and also South London audiences in 2021 as we were emerging from lockdown. Um, but the, the larger way in which you were able to play with the, the notion of, of subject and object or of, of agent and victim, I think is, is so important here because you have a really interesting play on uh, a very famous concert for for benefit purposes that was called concert for bangladesh um, and here you kind of flip that in again this kind of we can already see in a in a particularly prismatic manner um, but can you tell us a little bit more about that um, to contextualize the the clip that we'll watch yeah so i was you know approached um i think already before lockdown um by the Samdani Art Foundation and Diana Campbell, their curator, to sort of think about a, a response to the 50th anniversary of the concert for Bangladesh, which was originally, you know, uh, Ravi Shankar went to George Harrison, his friend, to see if they might do something to benefit, you know, the, the as yet unformed new nation of Bangladesh. Um, and you know, interestingly, historically, then, you know, Ravi Shankar and his group were reduced to a support act or a warm up act for a bunch of, you know, aging male white rock stars. And, you know, while very worthy and, you know, the original concert continues to generate money to support, uh, you know, uh, some of the poorest people in Bangladesh and Bangladesh is really on the forefront of climate change since vast areas of the country are, are in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one of the, you know, countries most impacted by other people's emissions. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to revisit it, but just we thought of, you know, what would be a sort of, what would be a quiet radical proposition? And it was just to change the syntax to be the concert from Bangladesh, because and this also evolved through lockdown because musicians in Bangladesh couldn't perform, you know, a lot of both traditional and contemporary musical forms in Bangladesh, musicians were struggling. And, you know, the in ecological impacts, internal climate displacement, it's not going anywhere. And within lockdown, we found a way to, you know, make this happen. So we created a virtual concert that was then broadcast, you know, at different time zones, uh, London, uh, well, Dhaka, London, New York, um, where, you know, obviously Dhaka is the capital of Bangladesh, but London and New York have two of the biggest diaspora populations. And we were able to work with some of the best musicians in the, in the country um, and through a number of genres from, you know, from traditional to uh, traditional ball music, which is like a sort of spiritual, um, poetry to, um, you know, Nazrul Sangeet, you know, uh, classical singing to electronic dance music and urban hip hop from Dhaka and, you know, personified by Gully Boy Rana and Tabib, who we see on screen here, who actually yeah. wrote a whole new track about the impact of climate change for the concert. And so it was, a, again, a huge co-production, you know, working with so many brilliant, talented people. And we discussed with each of the performers, you know, what locations within Bangladesh were really resonant for them to sort of bring it to life to kind of non Bangladeshi audiences. And we, we basically created a series of sets, you know, in unreal engine, a sort of virtual reality generator, because nobody could move. I mean, the lockdowns mm -hmm. were very severe in Bangladesh. And, um, and we used it as a fundraiser as well for friendship, uh, a major charity NGO in Bangladesh, which works specifically with climate refugees and uh and women with you know women in poverty so it, it was also made it even more like a concert because you had such wonderful merch 
It's true. I should have worn the T-shirt today. I didn't think of it. But, uh, <laughs> next time. Um, so maybe if we if we go to the the clip itself, should we play a little clip and then go? That to would be wonderful. And then we'll go to questions. Oops. Oh, I'll stop share there. I then... think that might be the place to do it. And so we now have four questions in the box. So again, each of these could probably spawn uh, another hour of conversation. But our first is from an anonymous attendee um, who asks, who are some of your influences and why? Um, we've been through some of them today, but perhaps there's some kind of top of your hit list that you weren't able to to mention in the course of the the few projects that we focused on that you'd like to discuss Oof. i mean my influences are probably endless in some ways it's you know it's it's almost hard to encapsulate them in one soundbite and i'm always you know encountering and and thinking um I guess, who haven't we talked about? I mean, Philip K. Dick and Oct Octavia Butler, Samuel Delaney, um, you know, it really roams far and wide. Um, you know, Mohammed Hamri, Emma Amos, you know, there's, you know, almost perhaps through working with such a sort of medium agnostic practice, it allows you to kind of channel so many voices and you have to because you want to think about what in textiles is 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 moving you uh what in color you know i mean emma amos is a great one for me in terms of color theory and the way i i work through um through paint you know and you know then gosh i mean you know each medium almost sort of attracts but they're also not always artistic references you know as we've seen you know so you know philip k dick samuel delaney and octavia butler are a world building they're thinking about narrativization out of the out of body but you know equally i'm i'm a huge um i'm a huge devotee of you know many things you know i grew up in a sufi family but i'm equally uh, motivated by tibetan buddhism because i think you know tibetan buddhism is a precursor to virtual reality in the way it thinks through ideas of maya and illusion i'm also you know I've practiced Tai Chi and Taoism for over 20 years. And, you know, that idea of full and empty, it's something I always think about compositionally. So things, things kind of weave in, in perhaps unexpected ways, uh, and find their, their, their locations within the kind of larger conversation that's going on. So we have two others, um, other than a wonderful comment from Sandra Leonard, who says, wow, so powerful. Um, so Jane Smith asks, is there a way to view the Leviathan films? Well, interestingly, we did during lockdown do a Leviathan broadcast season where we temporarily made them accessible. Um, but in the kind of larger um, imagining of the project, at least when it started, there was this idea that in a way it was the anti Netflix because you couldn't binge watch them, you might have to go and wait for the next, you know, the next episode might take especially thanks to COVID two years. And, you know, so it's it's a slow burn, I suppose, like artist cinema, which is, in a way, such a different beast, just in terms of funding and, and, and non -line non linear ways of approaching material. Um, but maybe to, a more simple answer is uh, we're hopefully going to be doing a big Leviathan exhibition at the I Film Museum in Amsterdam this October, um, where I'm hoping to have episode nine finished in time for. Thrilling. Oh, see, that's a, that's a great thing to announce here. Um, and the final question is, where will future work take you in the realm of medium or concept? Thank you for expanding our vision of art and geopolitical worlds. And that's from Beth Lunsbury. 
Um, thanks, Beth, for your question. Um, well, I actually have a show that just opened last week at uh, Veals in Brussels, which is really mining the, the exceptional legacy uh, of the African-American musician, writer, artist, and all-around polymath Yusuf Latif. And I've spent about seven years working with his estate and various of his collaborators and students. He sadly passed in 2013. And, you know, um, that was a that was for me a very interesting, you know, having spent so much time on oceans, I'd been quietly in the background working on this idea of the garden as a sort of transcendental allegory. And, you know, the show there really allowed me to to kind of externalize my my thinking around that. But in terms of a medium, what was very um, what was very new for me and was a was you know an exceedingly experimental part of that show was an installation that I called you know Night in the Garden of Love Seed Banks, and it's it's basically it's seven uh, portrait video screens, each one that has a basic plant form you know that uh, that I designed in collaboration with others, and. I don't know how to explain this simply. It's very simple if you're in the room with it. It's very, it's just beautiful because it hits you. Um, but it's seven screens that surround you like, like flower petals. And you've, and it's basically a garden that's growing, uh, that's algorithmically generated based on my designs. But Latif um, pioneered an amazing musical method called autophysiopsychic, which was a very structured method for for performers to kind of improvise around um, in a in a way that would activate the physical mental and spiritual faculties of both performer and audience and you know having studied uh, listened to the music since i was a child and you know really immersed myself in conversations around it what i was able to do in uh, february this year was pull together eight of latif's former collaborators and students to to make an autophysiopsychic session happen uh, in New Jersey in February. And we recorded two hours of music and we spent a huge amount of time creating our own algorithmic plant generators that would respond to the music. So in the installation, there's seven screens, each with a directional speaker. So I, I then split or sculpted, you know, uh, the musical session into seven channels and if you're Shazad, in this has been absolutely extraordinary i'm sorry to cut you off there i'm just trying to be mindful of our hour and I oh yeah i want to to thank everyone for for their time um and of course the yale center for british art for having us thank you shazad for inviting me to be your interlocutor i just want to sit here and listen more but i think a beautiful place to end this is precisely something that you said to me about your own methods and that rather than thinking of yourself as a visual artist the way you often think of yourself um, more in the spirit of someone um, engaged in musical improvisation. And I think you've made that so clear with this latest project. So certainly um, for any of the participants who are able um, to get to Veals, it's, it's going to be absolutely well worth it. Um, but we look forward to all of your future projects because there are many coming up. You have a very busy 2023 and 2024. So thank you for spending this hour with us. It's my pleasure. And thanks for being such a great host, Zoe. Oh, no, it's my Thank pleasure. Thank you, everyone, Anytime. For, for being with us. Thank Appreciate you, everyone. It. Goodbye.